After two years of denial, the Seattle Seahawks began 1987 focused on one goal, a return to postseason play. Seattle shook off an opening day defeat at Denver and returned home for their annual Kingdom Massacre of the Kansas City Chiefs. Fullback John L. Williams and company rushed for over 200 yards. Quarterback Dave Craig passed for three scores, and kicker Norm Johnson booted a team record five field goals, earning Seattle a convincing 43-14 win. But unfortunately, the cheers would soon grow silent as pro football was headed for its second strike in five years. After a one-week break, the Seahawks and the rest of the NFL returned with replacement players, some a bit more athletic than others. These untested players would have to be molded into a cohesive unit quickly, and it was here that the Seattle coaching staff pulled off a minor miracle. Knox's assistants proved their abilities to teach were as sharp as ever, turning butchers and bakers into football players. In the span of just 10 days, the Seahawk coaches were able to construct a team and ended up playing perhaps the most exciting game during the strike schedule, a 24-20 comeback over the replacement Dolphins. would prove crucial to Seattle's playoff hopes. And when the strike finally ended, a familiar face returned in time to help the Seahawks gain another victory in Detroit. Step with the snap, drops back to pass, fires one for the end zone, Largest got it, touchdown Seahawks! Eric Lane and Boyce Green, the split back behind Jeff Kemp on first down, Kemp back to pass, has a look, fires one in the end zone, Largest got it, same play as before, touchdown Seahawks! Get back, looking for Largent, throws to him in the corner of the end zone, touchdown Seahawks! And the Seahawks are making it look easy. By early in the third period, Largent had already shattered team records for catches and yardage and could easily have had more. But the classy receiver chose instead to take himself out of the game. It was really fun. It's always fun to run and catch the ball and score. But at the same time, you know, you feel a little bit um, funny, you know, just because of the situation. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if I'd have caught three passes and, and we'd have won, it would have been fine because the bottom line was we wanted to get out of here with a, with a victory and, and uh, carry on. Knox's Seahawks carried on quite nicely in the first game after the strike. Showing no ill effects from the four-week layoff, Seattle's veterans blasted the Raiders 35-13, the Seahawks' first victory in Los Angeles since 1983. If there was anything good about those four weeks was that we stuck together as a team and we learned a lot about each other and uh, how much we really want to go after something. And I think that really is going to help us in the long run throughout this whole season. With the end of the strike, Seahawk fans were eager to turn up the Kingdom decibels and cheer on their heroes. For visitors, the place became Thunderdome as the loud noise battered their eardrums while sparking the players on Seattle's special teams. Hunter Ruben Rodriguez and headhunters Sam Merriman, Tony Burse, Eric Lane, Kerry Justin, Randall Morris, Wilbur Strozier, David Hollis, Mark Moore, and M.L. Johnson all made contributions on the Seahawks special teams. 
Help also came from Seattle's veteran defensive line, anchored by nose tackle Joe Nash, number 72. and six-year veteran Jeff Bryant, number 77, kept busy at the point of attack, leaving rush lanes free for defensive end Jacob Green, number 79, the team's leading sacker and a Pro Bowl starter for the very first time. While Green, Alonzo Mitts, Randy Edwards, Roland Barbet, and Wes Dove handled play up front, Seattle's linebackers cut down additional pursuit angles. Bruce Schultz, Keith Butler, Greg Gaines, and rookie Tony Woods were solid role players in the Seahawks' complex defensive scheme. A liability in seasons past, opponents painfully learned that Seattle's linebacking unit now had far greater impact Safety Kenny Easley, number 45, paced the secondary as the team leader in interceptions and gained the fifth Pro Bowl start of his career. Other big plays were turned in by Eugene Robinson, Terry Taylor, Patrick Hunter, Paul Moyer, and Melvin Jenkins, a secondary that covered tightly and hit fiercely. Seattle's linebacking core featured the two biggest defensive stories of 1987. The luck of the lottery brought Oklahoma All-American Brian Bosworth to King County, where he promptly began carving out a reputation. Bosworth's flamboyance attracted immediate attention. His unconventional ways and showmanship were new to most fans, who found there was no middle ground with the Boz. He was either loved or reviled, but Brian Bosworth could never be ignored. Pitch the ball to Anderson, power sweep right side, a block from Van Horn, he cuts in behind it out to the 40, and gets dumped by Bosworth to Nash. Bosworth steals the ball away, takes off down the other way, stumbling at the 15, 10, the 5, down, down, down on the 1. one. Holy Bosworth took the ball away. And but behind the flashy image was a dedicated young athlete constantly seeking to improve himself. I'm going to try to increase uh, my understanding of the game as quickly as I can, but it's still going to take time. I'm very, very tough on myself and an extreme perfectionist and, and extremely critical of every performance that I go out and do. I, I've never been able to find a performance that I'm happy with. But players like Ken easily expect good things from Bosworth. He's added a lot of character to our football team and a lot of good things to our defense. As soon as he becomes comfortable with uh, the defensive scheme that we run and his particular role within the defense, uh, he will be an impact player in this league for a long time to come. Fred Young is already an impact player. Four seasons, four Pro Bowls, and unanimous acclaim as one of the finest linebackers playing today. He was Seattle's leading tackler, forced and recovered the most fumbles, and logged nine sacks. No other Seahawk linebacker ever had a year like that. He's a, he's a player. He uh, has a nose for the football. He has great instinct. He gets where the ball is, whether it's run or pass, and uh, also a good blitzer, good dogger when we want to send him. And uh, coming into his own, getting more confident with what we're asking him to do. The pass is Hill John, a third and 25. He tries to get away. It's a pass picked off by Lamb at the 50th to the 40th down in open field. He couldn't go all the way. He's being chased. Touchdown, Seahawks. Brad Young taking it on in. The name may be young, but for Seattle's best defender, clutch plays have become old hat. In 
1987, only two conference quarterbacks had higher passing rankings than Dave Craig, still the most obvious barometer of Seattle success. I think David Craig is one of the top quarterbacks in the National Football League. When he's hot, he really is truly hot. There's no question about that. And if we knew the answer to that, we'd put it in a bottle and, and we'd give it to him whenever we needed that hot play. Through eight Seahawks seasons, Craig has seen good times and bad, yet has learned to weather the hardships and enjoy the successes. The quarterback gets all the credit when you win, and when you lose, the quarterback takes all the blame. So I can handle the, the blame part. I've been used to doing that the last couple of years. Uh, and the credit part, when we win, I want to dish it around to everybody, because for us to win, we need everybody to perform up and above their expectations. Craig dished off his passes in democratic fashion as well, finding tight end Mike Tice and wide receivers Ray Butler, Paul Scancy, Daryl Turner, and Jimmy Teal. Their success could be much attributed to the excellent performance by Seattle's offensive line, the team's most consistent unit in 1987. The front wall was manned by veteran centers Blair Bush, Grant Fiesel, and Stan Eisenhuth. Massive tackles Ron Mattis, Mike Wilson, and John Borchardt. And guards Edwin Bailey, Alvin Powell, and All-Pro Brian Millard, number 71, whose goals for excellence were largely met throughout the year. We want to be able to run the football. We want to have the best rushing attack in the NFL. We have two of the finest running backs in the league, and we want to be the best. We want to be what people say, hey, let's get on attack like what the Seahawks have. The Seahawk attack featured a powerhouse named John L. Williams, who gouged out 500 rushing yards. Yet John L. also had the soft hands to finish second in team receptions. Williams blazed his own path, either for himself or running mate Kurt Warner. Only the strike kept Kurt from a fourth thousand yard season, but his 985 yards were still second best in the AFC. Kurt Warner just wants to excel. When he gets the football in his hands, he's like a crazy man. He's different, you know. He can sit here and talk to you and be real calm and collected and cool. But when he gets that football in his hands, I'll watch out. Because that guy, when he gets the ball, you don't know what he's going to do. He doesn't know what he's going to do. All he wants to do is go forward with that football. When the situation called for the spectacular, Warner was there. And when trouble loomed, somehow Kurt would ride to the rescue and save the day. During a six-week span at midseason, the Seahawks rode Kurt Warner's sturdy legs to five wins. After consecutive Kingdome victories against Minnesota, Green Bay, and San Diego, Seattle vaulted into first place in the AFC West. Ahead was a primetime showdown with the Raiders and a chance to widen the division lead. But what had historically been a convincing Seahawk victory quickly turned into a nightmare. The Raiders avenged four straight Kingdom defeats with an easy 37-14 victory. Matters only grew worse the following week in Pittsburgh when the Seahawks lost a fourth quarter lead. Postseason hopes appeared to be in jeopardy when John Elway and the rugged Broncos came to town. But this year, the Seahawks would not let their playoff dreams slip away. Elway gets a snap, drops back the pass, straightens up, fires one that's going to be picked off by Seattle, back inside the five, and turned out to the field by Mel Jenkins, who's up to the 30, 35, Jenkins hit the Seattle ball. Over the 36 or 37 yard line. Craig working out of the shotgun, four wide receivers in, gets it, looks, fires one to Butler in the end zone, he leaps up, has it, touchdown Seahawks! Green, Bryant, Woods all up there, and here they come after Elway, who's back to pass. Being hemmed in, they've got him, and down he goes. 
Seahawks at the Bronco 40-yard line. I formation backs. Warner gets the pitch, gives to Largen, who crosses it back to Craig. Craig's going deep down the middle. He's got a man open. Touchdown, Seahawks! The Butler! You talk about razzle-dazzle at its best. That was it. The triumph over the AFC champs was followed a week later with a 34-21 win against the Bears. Chicago's only non-strike regular season loss in Soldier Field all year. John L. Williams' spectacular third quarter touchdown broke open a tight game as the Seahawks all but wrapped up a playoff berth, winning two critical games they had been expected to lose. Seattle could not clinch home field advantage in the final week at Kansas City, but an achievement of historical significance was accomplished, an achievement Steve Largent will never forget. As Largent goes in motion toward the right, Craig back to pass, blitz coming, Craig goes short, he's got a reception by Largent, who makes the catch and now becomes the all-time career receiving leader in the National Football League. And Steve Largent has just made his 751st reception in his NFL career for a new receiving record. Records don't mean anything to Steve Largent. The thing that's going to mean something to Steve Largent is Steve will say to himself, I played the best I could play. I was part of a championship organization. I helped win a championship. Yeah, and that's what's going to mean a lot to Steve Largent. The goal of a championship still remains for Largent, but he has accomplished everything else an athlete can achieve in football. A Super Bowl ring may still be in his future. A berth in the Pro Football Hall of Fame is guaranteed. For the first time in three years, the Seahawks were back in the playoffs. But the setting was not the home sweet dome of Seattle, but hostile Houston deep in the unfriendly heart of Texas. Our whole season comes down to one play. Do you understand? You got to hold on to Fellas, the if you ever sold out in your life, this is the time to do it right now. Hold on to your Now dreams, is baby. the time. Special right. I know you can do it. Hold on to your I dreams. know you can do it. Let's go. One, two, three. Oh. Moon back, first pass the day. Schultz comes on a blitz. Moon lets one fly deep up the right side for Gibbons. Picked off on the 20-yard line. Seahawks down the Playing without an injured Kurt Warner, Seattle used the early turnover to jump to a 7-0 first period advantage. But it would be the Seahawks' last comforting moment of the game as the two teams continuously battled for the lead. Midway through the game, Houston led by six, but then the AFC's best punt returner stole the spotlight. The Seahawks have Bobby Joe back. Gossett gets the kick away. Bobby Joe Edmonds runs up, fields on the fly at the 28, up to the 30-yard line, 35 up the right side of the 40, breaking away, and could be on his way down the sideline. He's at the Houston 30, one man to beat, and down he goes inside the 20-yard line. That's a big play, man. Big play. That's the way to go. Norm Johnson's two field goals knotted the game at 13. But by late in the fourth quarter, the Oilers were ahead by a touchdown. The defense would now have to stand its ground. The Seahawks have a chance now. They'll take over first down and 10 out at the 20. And the Seahawks now with 147 to go have one timeout to use. 80 yards away from getting the time touchdown. So here we go. In Seattle's finest hour of 1987, Dave Craig led the Seahawks on a tension-packed final drive battling a hostile crowd and a hungry Houston defense. One time, one time, one time. Craig again operating out of the shotgun. Has time, throws one in the end zone. Touchdown, Seahawks to Largent. Although the Seahawks have been outgained all day, regulation play ended in a 20-20 tie. And in overtime, Seattle appeared to be on the verge of stealing away with the victory.
Boone drops back to pass. A lot of time. Throws one. Deflected high in the air. Young, did he come up with it at the 42? We're waiting to see. Sure looked like an interception to me. But remember, this is a playoff game as well. So that means they've got maybe a couple of more cameras trained on the action. Further review by the replay official. Incomplete pass. Second down. Well, tough to believe from all the replays we saw of it. But they do rule it an incomplete pass. The decision would advance Houston and not Seattle to the next round. But although 1987 ended in disappointment, the Seahawks had made it back to the playoffs. In the five years since Chuck Knox has coached the franchise, only five other NFL teams have won more games. The Seahawks have won in the past and are planning on winning in seasons to come. We want you, the player to come to practice and get a smile on your face and let's go to work and let's give an honest day's work and let's come out of the shoot on Sunday and play as hard as you can play and give the very, very best that you can give. And we always say the two great things about professional football, one is winning, two's getting paid. That is the basis upon which everything else is built, burning the desire on the part of the individual player to want to do the very, very best that he can do. In 1987, the Seattle Seahawks successfully pledged to go back to the playoffs. And that is exactly where the Seattle Seahawks expect to be in 1988.